compel as much change as possible. And, uh, so you can look over these and, and pray for all of them. But the part about being here at church and being believers um, and doing fellowship is also to hearing the prayer requests that we have, uh, we can see, but also the praise reports. And things are going awesome. So if you have some, please shout them out. Or you can, uh, if you have a praise, or uh, either a praise or a prayer request, you can also talk to Chris. And we can get that on the prayer chain. So, any praise or prayer requests? In the back. Get another boat and still gonna be able to go out. So. My praise is my niece who's pregnant with twins has made it to 32 weeks, and so she could have the babies anytime now, and there's no risk to their lives. Awesome. So we are super, super helpful. Yeah, definitely. And, and you can tell they're from all of us, good luck with the twins. <laughs> Of what 
that's going on with her. And so we're just going to go ahead and I'm going to just go ahead and read it. Sims International's uh, Marcy Strauss asked recently, what if God had created us but left no one, no revelation of who he is? What would life be like if we had a vague sense of God's existence, but there was no way to know him? I couldn't help thinking that there are many people in our world who believe that is what happened. Either they have no access to the Bible in their language, or they have rejected the truth that is his revelation of himself in written form. And many don't understand that Jesus Christ is his root is his revelation to himself in human form. That breaks my heart. May 26th through June 4th, we in Sim will be uh, meditating on God's name and character as we meet together in our various locations for corporate prayer. Please pray that we will grow in intimacy with God and with each other, with the result that more people understand our Creator's desire for a relationship with us. May we not be too busy to, or too frightened to draw near to him. God richly blessed my time in Southwest, well, Southwest Washington in April. Special thanks to friends in Woodland Presbyterian Church for so graciously hosting the meet and greet on April 22nd, providing, providing a welcoming atmosphere and delicious snacks. And thanks to all who made the effort uh, to come. It was with joy uh, to... It was a joy to have that time with you. Special thanks also to my sister and her family, six households together who took the time uh, from their busy schedules to spend individual time with me. I was honored to stay with my niece, and Christina, husband James, and their six kids. The boys even gave up their bedroom for me and slept in the living room. James and Christina are members of the Whitecliffe Bible Translators and while Christina cares for the family and uses her gifts of hospitality and compassion, James trains and supports translators all over the world with his expertise in IT, often remotely. And there's a number of praise and prayer requests that uh, she has, and I'm going to post this out on the uh, pin board, whatever that is, out there for all of you to take a look at. But um, through my email with her, she also discussed a colleague named Matt, who was also doing some amazing work for them. He was uh, trans helping translate into like four different other versions wow. or la uh, languages for scripture. So if you want to keep both Carolyn and Matt in your prayers, um, they would definitely need it. And uh, one thing about that kind of work, uh, whether you are abroad or working remotely from the US, whatever it is, um, Ministry like that can change by the minute. Um, I've had many friends who are uh, either gone on mission trips or are missionaries, and it is absolutely um, something that can change by the minute or the, by, even by the second. Um, but it's always amazing to watch and to hear uh, what God does in those communities and how the Word and the Holy Spirit are moving. Um, so again, just keep them in your prayers and, uh, and just ask that God is going to continue to work through them and work through all of the translating. Because often I think we take uh, the Bible for granted here. You can go down to Walmart, you can almost go anywhere and grab a Bible, but there are still places in the world where people have never even seen or heard of a Bible. So it's an amazing ministry to, to support, uh, both individually and as, as a church. And I, and I find it awesome that this church has been uh, supporting a number of ministries. So with that, we can just go into prayer, and then we'll get right back into our service. Generally, Father, we thank you so much that we are here today. We praise your name for all the many blessings that we heard today. We also pray that you will be with all the requests. We pray that you will continue to guide us, to continue to grow our faith, and may we draw close to you. Lord, today may I decrease and may you increase. May it be your word that everyone here is listening to. Holy Spirit, may you fill me and fill all of us so that we may understand and recognize your truth, your word, and how you would have us live out our faith. Lord, we thank you 
so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you that we get to meet here in fellowship. We pray this all in your name. Amen. So last week, we kick-started uh, a new series called One Another. And again, I love that photo just because it's a mash of all different colors, and it really is a great symbol of the church. Uh, we're just a mash full of messy people trying to serve God together. And last week, uh, we learned that there are 59 different times that the phrase one another is used in the New Testament. And out of those 59, we learned that 15 times alone, the phrase love one another is used. And that's where we kicked off last week with love one another. And we learned that loving one another isn't an option. We learned that uh, we love one another because Christ first loved us. And finally, we le learned that we love one another so that all will know that we are disciples of Jesus. And so the goal with this series is not only to challenge us, to stretch us and encourage our faith, but also to draw, draw closer to Jesus individually, but also as a church, that we as a church can support one another, encourage one another, and continue our faith in Jesus Christ. So that ultimately, we will be equipped to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So when people come into this church or we meet them on the street, they will see Jesus when they see us. And they will just see that one thing that makes us different in some way that they get curious, and that is the door that God uses to open that conversation. And so today, there's a lot actually to go into for today, so we're just really just going to jump right into it. And this uh, topic today is accept one another. And it comes from uh, Romans uh, chapter 15, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. And so far, this seems almost like identical to our phrasing last week uh, with love one another. Um, but Paul starts off this whole idea of accepting one another in Romans in chapter 14. So you can see already that he has quite a bit to actually talk about when it comes to this idea of accepting one another. And so we're just going to jump into uh, where Paul starts off in chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on his disciple on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat anything, but another man's whose faith is weak only eats vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. There's a lot in these three little lines, and so essentially just, we're just going to break all of this down. This entire passage to, talking about how we are called to accept one another. And so first... What does it mean by we're meant to accept those whose faith is weak? It's, a, it's kind of a harsh phrasing. We, we, we don't really use the word weak when we call out other people uh, in, in terms of their faith. And so essentially what Paul is saying here is that we are all at different stages in our faith walk. Regardless of where you are, you, you are at a different stage than where I am. I'm at a different stage than where you are. And so all of us essentially need to recognize that. And this is what Paul is saying. There are those who are new to faith. There are those who are growing their faith. And there are those who have been keeping step with Jesus for a long time, some even their entire lives. And then there are some that maybe just growing their faith isn't a priority. We're all at different stages in life and different stages in our faith. And as a church, we're called to recognize that's okay. That's actually how it's meant to be. Because you don't go from A to Z. You have to go through the whole alphabet. You don't go from zero to 100. You have to go through all of it. Faith is the same way. We have to go from new believer to mature believer. And now, with that being said, I want to I wanna set the record straight. Having a strong faith in Jesus Christ is not about how long you have been a believer. It's not how long you've been a believer. It doesn't matter if you were 
saved at three years old and have been a faithful believer uh, your entire life? No. <laughs> it matters that your faith has been active. How active your faith has been. And so this isn't about getting your ticket punched or getting fire insurance. Your faith has to be active. I know people who have been Christians their entire lives, but in many ways, their faith is still new. I know people who have been uh, believers for only a few years, but they're the most passionate people I've ever met with their faith. So I want to give a simple example about this, and that's uh, that of going to a gym. I know, right? Ew, don't go to that gym. <laughs> anyway. But if you only go to a gym one hour for one day a week, it's not going to make any difference at all. Even if you work out like crazy for that one hour, all that's going to happen is the next day you're going to wake up sore and you're never going to want to do that again. It's not going to make any difference just going one hour a day or one hour for one day a week. The only way to make a difference in your health and strength uh, by going to a gym is by going regularly. You have to learn how to use the equipment. You have to get a proper workout routine. You can even hire a personal trainer. And you have to put the time and energy into actually going to the gym and making a difference in your health. That is the only way a gym membership works. I, I really wish someone would bring out a study of how, many, how much money is wasted by New Year's resolutions on just gym memberships. <laughs> it wouldn't be quite a lot, I imagine. And so faith is the same way. If we only show up to our faith for one hour to two hours a week, it's not going to make a difference. So when a crisis comes, or difficult times come, or even if you just get challenged on something, it's going to be a rough time. Because your faith isn't continuing to progress. You have to put the dedication and time into growing your faith. And this is why in James chapter 2 it says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Our faith needs action behind it. It means we have to be in a growing relationship with Jesus. And oftentimes I think people kind of misunderstand the idea of a relationship with Jesus because we tend to think of relationships as man and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, things like that. But a relationship with Jesus is no different. You are growing closer to him. You are learning about him. He is helping you grow. He is revealing things to you that are hindering your faith. And how he can grow closer to you. And you learn about his love and his joy and his peace by growing your relationship with him. And a great deal about this is not just that you are growing your relationship, but you are listening to the Holy Spirit and where he is directing you. You also listen about uh, and learn about God the Father. You learn about God. You have to grow your relationship with God. It can't be something you just show up to a few hours a week because it, it won't work. And finally, we need to be obedient in that. James chapter 1 also says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, not deceive anyone else, but deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And this is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the difference between strong and weak believers. There are those who have a strong faith. There are those who have a weaker faith weaker faith. There are those who are continuing to grow. There are those who are again, it's not a priority for them. But all of this comes down to either way, strong or weak, new, growing, or mature, we are all called to accept one another. But Paul also said, adds something in verse 2 that we need to make very clear about this. We accept one another, but we do so without quarreling with one another. He says, says specifically, without passing judgment on uh, disputable matters. Now Paul, when he gives this example in verses 1 through 3, he's talking about food. 
And this actually isn't all that surprising when you think about it, because in the early church, there was a lot of confusion about how to follow Jesus in the proper way. Um, and when you think about it, and you really learn about the first century church, but specifically the first several years after Christ's ascension, you learn that a lot of Christians were struggling with the idea of how do you follow Jesus. Um, and it really came down to, uh, in many cases, between Jews and Gentiles. For the Jews uh, who became Christian, many of them were struggling with the idea that I am saved by Jesus, and they believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but they also believed that they still had to follow the law of Moses. And this just wasn't the case. And, and Paul and the disciples and, the, and various other uh, deacons and leaders uh, state this later on. And on the flip side, the Gentiles were struggling with bringing in their former practices from their other religious backgrounds. And so Paul brings up just the example of food because it was a common uh, misunderstanding. The, the Jewish Christians believed that they still had to eat what we would call essentially kosher meals, whereas the Gentiles were just eating anything. And so this created some conflict between the two just because they weren't entirely sure what was correct. And so these are the dis kinds of disputable matters that Paul is talking about. Both of them are Christians. Both of them believe in Jesus. Both of them are following Jesus as best as they can, but they have a disputable matter that has come up. One believes in eating one type of food, the other believes in kind of just eating everything. Now, it isn't until Paul and the apostles, they come along and actually set the record straight, saying, okay, don't make what is clean unclean. And so those are the disputable matters that Paul is talking about. It's essentially the areas of our lives where God and the Holy Spirit are convicting us of our own personal walk with Jesus. What are not disputable matters is what the core of the Scripture is teaching us. And the core of this passage, or this passage is to accept one another. And the disputable matters are, again, the areas of Scripture where the Holy Spirit is convicting us personally of our faith walk. And it's something that we need to make sure that it is remaining our own conviction to our own faith walk. Now, when we come to this idea of disputable matters, there are really only two caveats I want to mention about this idea. Because these two caveats do relate to us and how we fellowship with one another. The first is that when someone is convicted by the Holy Spirit differently than you, it is our job as fellow believers to support them in their spiritual growth. So in some cases, like in Paul's case that he's giving the example of food, if one person is feeling that they can only eat a certain type of food, the other believer does not need to come in and tell them immediately, this is what the scripture means. Even if the scripture is, cor that is correct, as Paul later says it is, God is convicting this person of that particular thing in their life. We always go back to the core of what the scripture is teaching. So if it's a disputable matter, we can lead that person to grow in their spiritual faith and ensure that they are still listening to the core of the scripture. The second caveat is that we need to be mindful of ourselves. We need to make sure that our words and our actions aren't leading the other person to have a false understanding of scripture. Because if we're doing that, we might as well close up shop. Because we're doing more harm than good. We are not portraying love, we are essentially condemning somebody. And this all comes back to we need to love one another and we need to accept one another. And in Romans uh, 14, verse 15, Paul even continues to state, if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. So Paul really kind of just hits it right on the nail. 
Christ died for them. You need to be supporting them in their faith and their walk so that they can grow closer to Jesus. It may be in a different place than you are, and that's okay. We need to be loving them first, and we need to be accepting them where they are at. And that's really our first and really simple point. We are called to accept one another. Now, at this point, you might have already gleaned this uh, by what the scripture has been teaching. But we are called to accept people where they are at. We are not called to accept people where scripture is actually telling them to be. You need to accept people with where they're at at the moment. If you're con trying to convince somebody that they need to be like Paul when they are a new believer, you're going to drive them away. It's not going to work. They need milk, not solid food yet. They need to be able to grasp the, the core of Scripture, not the nuances that later come with Scripture. Now, I also want to make it clear that this applies to everybody. Believer or not believer, we are called to accept people where they are at. Whether it is a friend, whether it is a family member, whether it is someone you meet on the street, whether it is an enemy to Christianity, we are called to accept people where they are at, not where God is calling them to be later. You can't ask someone to go from 0 to 100 immediately. They have to go all the way. They have to have that journey. And let's face it, with Jesus, the journey is the important part. How you are serving God in your journey, how you are growing with Him, how you are listening to Him, how He is revealing things to you, and how He is growing not just your faith, but your life and your family, and everything that is tied to that, that is the important part. How we are serving God throughout our journey. So that's the important part. When we eventually get to the end, our job is hope, by the end of that, our job should have hopefully got us to the point of saying, where God is saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the point, but the journey is the important part. Now, Paul also hits on something in verse 3 that I've come to believe is one of the most detrimental actions that a Christian can take to one another. And that's judging one another. Now, the word judging has a really negative connotation in our society today. We really don't like it. And so uh, we're going to take a step back and really look at what Scripture is teaching us. But more specifically, we're going to look at what Jesus is telling us. So in verse 3, Paul says, The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. God has accepted them. So again, God has accepted them both. And they need to be focused on their relationship with God. They need to be focused on their growth with God. And we need to be supporting each other in our spiritual growth. But Paul puts it, by judging and showing contempt for one another, that's not what we are meant to do. And so, really just to get this idea of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to judge, we're going to just listen to Jesus straight up. So in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, this is an extremely powerful passage, but it's also one of the most misquoted passages in Scripture. So we're just going to read it. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be used to measure you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they will they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. 
Again, very powerful passage, but you can imagine why that is misquoted a lot. Now, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is talking about how one is, or is seven, sorry, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is setting the precedent of what will happen if Christians judge hypocritically or in self-righteousness. <laughs> And so he's setting the precedent just saying that is not in any way how we're meant to judge. Or I should say that is the, the judgment of what will come if you do judge hypocritically or with self-righteousness. And in verses 3 through 5, he is rebuking the Christian who is guilty of judging in a self-righteous or hypocritical way. And in verse 6, he's essentially just showing and teaching that scripture must be used properly. You don't throw what is sacred into what is not. So does this mean that Christians are not supposed to judge? No. We are called to judge. But we are not meant to judge from a point of contempt, condemnation, hypocrisy, or self-righteousness. What we are meant to do is to keep each other accountable to the faith that we have and the scripture that we profess to believe in. And essentially, judge is just that for Christians. We're keeping each other accountable of our faith. But you can't keep a brother or sister accountable of their faith if you don't judge. And again, it's not in a negative way as Jesus is teaching with hypocrisy or self-righteousness. It's about keeping one accountable to what they profess to believe and if they are following Scripture as it is commanding us to do. And if that wasn't enough, Paul comes along in Romans uh, 14, 13 and says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother and sister. And that leads us to our second point. We cannot cause others to stumble. When we accept one another, we are supporting them in their spiritual walk with Jesus, and we need to ensure that we are not causing them to stumble or fall in their faith. Now, in verse 13, Paul isn't just talking about food and judgment as the things that we are trying to avoid when he says stumbling blocks. He's talking about really anything that can cause a fellow believer to stumble. Uh, one of the most prolific examples that I can give, because it's just so prevalent in our society, is alcohol. It's just a, a thing that a lot of people struggle with, and I know uh, quite a few people who do struggle with alcohol, both believers and non-believers. It's just a struggle in our society. It's, it's one that has been for a very long time. And I know Christians who don't struggle with alcohol, who have decided to completely reject alcohol as a way to support friends and family who do struggle with it. Not only because they want them to continue in their sobriety, but also because they are not going to cause them to stumble and relapse. That is a very modern take on what Paul is talking about. We are meant not to cause anyone to stumble. Because if we're going to cause someone to stumble, that's going to come back on us. And Paul reiterates this idea several times throughout the New Testament. Um, he often talks about accepting one another uh, throughout many of the letters that he has written, including in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Starting in verse 9, he says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have, who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brother in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. 
Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. So really, we can't get any more clear than that. When it comes to this idea that we're not meant to cause anyone else to stumble. So if our actions cause others to lead, fall into a false understanding of God and a false belief about God, or just to fall into sin, we sin. Now I also want to uh, talk about one little caveat really quick, is that there is a difference between knowingly causing someone to stumble and fall and just going through life and it happens. Where people who are around each other, we each struggle with something. We each struggle with something that Christ is working on us with. But there's a difference between if you unknowingly cause someone to stumble, which should hopefully result in just a conversation, a loving conversation between the two believers or people, whoever it is, and so that that cannot happen again. But if you are knowingly causing someone to stumble and you know that someone is struggling with something and you say or do something that causes them to, that comes upon you as sin. We are meant to love and accept one another so that we can make disciples of all nations, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ who brings salvation to all. That is our goal. That is what we are charged with by Jesus Christ. And when we look back in Romans chapter 15, in verse 5, May God, who gives endurance and encouragement, give you the spirit of unity amongst yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Which leads us to our final point. We are meant to glorify God together. We are called to accept one another. We are not meant to cause anyone else to stumble, but we are meant to praise God together and glorify Him. No matter what or where your faith walk is, a new believer, a growing believer, or a mature believer, you should always be growing closer to God. You never just arrive as a Christian. That pretty much point is when you get to see God and he says, good, well done, good and faithful servant. That is when you have arrived. When you get to see the glory of God in heaven. While we're here on earth, on this little miserable mud ball, all it is is growth. That is always meant to be our, our, our focus. And maybe you're listening online and and you're here today, and you're not sure about this, you know, maybe you're saying to yourself, this all sounds good and everything, but I have some history. We all have history. We all struggle. We're messy. We are hurting. And we all have baggage. But Jesus is saying that you can leave all of it at his feet. You can always turn to him. He will always bring you through and maybe you, you have been hurt by the church or by another Christian. If that's the case, I'm really sorry. Unfortunately, that is far too often the case today. But neither Jesus, nor Scripture, nor I am asking you to follow me, a church, a religion. I am asking you to consider going into a relationship with Jesus who won't hurt you, who won't betray you, who won't leave you. If that is you, Jesus wants you to know that he loves you. That he accepts you and that he will never hurt or abandon you. We fail often. I fail often. It's just what we do. It's because of this fallen world and everything that we in our sinful nature have in us. It's just what we do. We fail when we fall short of God's glory. But it's because of his great love for us. It's because of his acceptance of us. Which doesn't make sense. God looked down and saw just how horrible 
and evil and wicked we have become, and then he decides, yeah, I'm going to send my son to die. It doesn't make sense that God would come down in human form to save us. But he did, and the only reason that I have ever found in Scripture is because he loves us. That is why we serve this God. When Jesus reaches into the lives of people, when he has reached into my life, it is transforming in a way that you just can't imagine. And all you can do at that point is start glorifying him because of what he has done in your life. And you rejoice with others when you hear about three-year-olds asking for worship songs. Or three-year-olds using potty. I mean, <laughs> even the small things. I mean, the fact that we have children, a gift from God. The fact that we are here today and we have the gift of being able to worship here today. The fact that we can just be in fellowship and support one another. All that is an amazing gift of God because he loves us. Even my own story. You've heard some of it, but from 2020 to pretty much, what, three weeks ago? My life was not in a way or in a place that I would absolutely have wanted. I was in a job I hated. We were living in my parents' basement, because who wants to do that at 36? <laughs> Life was not going the direction I wanted at all. And while I was preparing for stop, <laughs> while I was preparing for the sermon, I was going through it in my head, and I was writing it down on my computer, and then I happened to look over and I saw my wife. Uh, planting her plants, and then I saw my son just playing in the backyard, and I started bawling because I was sitting in that office writing a sermon while my family is now living in a house, which is awesome, by the way. <laughs> and God is so good that he brought me from the place, my lowest place of depression, my lowest place where I hated where I was, and I couldn't do anything to change that. Thank you, COVID. But... <laughs> It was something that I can't even describe his transforming love and power to be able to bring me here today and be with you and celebrate with you just everything that we were going through. Jesus is always faithful to us. And he has always brought me out of darkness and brought me into the light, specifically his light. And if, that's with you, and if that is true for you today, praise God. And may we spur one another on in encouragement to go closer to Jesus. If you are wondering whether you're online or here, if that's the way it really is with Jesus, with this whole Christianity thing, or you're wondering what the next step is, I am happy to sit down with you and talk about the next step. Please come. If you're online, come visit. If you're here at 10.30 and 9.30 for Mouse Time. But the way to do that is grow closer to Jesus. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Read scripture. See how he loves you. Be in prayer about what God has done for you and what he can do for you. And I love how God works in many ways, as today we're talking about how not only God has accepted us, but how we are called to accept one another. And today we're also going to be celebrating communion, where Jesus, only hours before the Last Supper, was going to be crucified, or after the hour, after the crucifixion. <laughs> after the Last Supper, he would be crucified. So today, no matter where you are at, no matter what has happened, no matter how impossible it may seem, Jesus loves you. Jesus accepts you. And we must do the same in order to glorify him together. So that whoever walks through these doors, whoever you meet on the street, will know that you are his disciple by how you love one another 
and how about you accept one another. Now I'm also going to say, both of those things are difficult. Sometimes they even seem impossible. And that is when we really need to draw close to Jesus. So we can see people in his, through his eyes. Because accepting people where they are at, they may be yelling in your face about something. They may want nothing to do with you. Or they just don't get what you're talking about. But we accept people where they are at because that's where Christ starts. He accepted us where we were at and then pulled us out. We need to, to be able to do the same. And so as we are in this spirit of accepting one another, I'm going to pray Then we can come up and uh, get communion elements and then we'll, we'll pray and be done. But if you heard, uh, if you heard nothing else today, this is what I want to leave you with. Romans 15, chapter, or chapter 15, verse 7. Accept one another, then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. If there is nothing else you heard today, if that's all you take away from today, if two years from now I, you don't remember a thing I said other than accept one another, for God accepts you, and may we glorify Him together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God that accepts us where we are at. You are a God who sends his son Jesus to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from the pit that we find ourselves in in life. And we praise your name together as you are a savior who was willing to take our punishment upon the cross because of your great love and how much you accept us. Lord, we pray that as we take communion, you will be glorified. As we remember your sacrifice, may we worship you in our hearts. We pray this in your name. Amen. Um, if you would like uh, myself to bring some communion to you, I am more than happy to do that. If not, feel free to come and take communion. like me to bring it to you, you can just raise your hand. Jesus' body was broken for us, taking upon the death that we deserve. Lord, we thank you for your, your body and your sacrifice. The blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the shedding of your blood that we may, we may be cleansed.
Remember, we are having a quick meeting afterwards. So please stick around for that, and I think.